Hi, I'm Heather, and I'm here with my friend Sandra, and uh, she is a cancer survivor. So she's been six years in remission, and she's going to share all of this good stuff with us about how she walked through that that process in the healthiest way um, that she could learn how. So, hi. <laughs> so tell me, mm -hmm. um, we're in Venice. Yes. One of the hearts of you know more of a holistic living. Uh, community. Correct. There's so much here, um, rich in knowledge and farmers markets and you name it. Um, you just got here how long ago? Uh, I arrived in January mm -hmm. and basically I feel like, especially in Southern California and on the west side, there's a farmers market every single day yeah. and the produce that I would get when I was living in New York City was directly coming from this area yeah. so i thought let's go to the epicenter of where health and wellness is and start my journey mm -hmm. to become an esthetician and also a health educator from hippocrates and this was a great starting place for me yeah that's great and you grew up in in new york City. i grew up in new york yes okay so tell me a little bit about what brought you to the place of starting to go on the journey of more of a healthier sure. lifestyle choices and foods and right all that kind of stuff so well i think it starts pretty much back when i was diagnosed and even before that um, i was living and working in tribeca and i was there during september 11th 2001 um, and the place that i was doing special events at was six blocks away from where the Trade Center, the yeah. towers were. And my apartment was five blocks away. Yeah. So I was really part of that community. And not only did I witness everything, but I was also evacuated from my apartment, as well as the restaurants that I was doing PR and events for were all closed down during that time. Mm -hmm. And so not realizing how harmful and how once we were told, oh, it's just dust and then it became the toxic plume yeah. and so they had no idea they had no, yeah. idea they had no idea that there was asbestos yeah. and everything else all of these chemicals and metals that were being constantly burned right. um, it was burning for a good three to four months wow. and we were breathing that in and regardless of whether it was just an air purifier or a system you're still getting that into the air and into your apartments and so from that moment on, um, I did not have exact direct effects at that point. But years later, I started to have a cough. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing this. Still living in New York. Still living in New York, still living downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was yeah. raised downtown. So right. it was my in my nature, my nurture. Your I mean, everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it was a community that I believed in. And in fact, I helped launch one of the restaurants that was the first restaurant in New York City to open post 9-11 in Tribeca. And it was called The Harrison. And it was an amazing day. Bloomberg came down and gave us sort of the champagne bottle wow. toast. Yeah, it was a really big deal. And it was nice to be a part of it since it was my neighborhood. It's kind of like a rebirth, a rebuilding absolutely. of yes, that Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because at that point, you still had to show ID to get past Canal Street. Wow. And I had a tank, an army tank, parked in front of my loft building. So oh it was traumatic. I mean, the yeah. entire experience. And then coming back to it, you felt everyone that was there felt a sense of, let's bring it back, let's make Tribeca great. Right. And I had kind of gone through my life and kept working in the hotel business and hospitality and then I was up for a very big job in 2009 2010 mm -hmm. and I started to ironically get into raw vegan food because my cousin was an ABT dancer okay. and he was dehydrating food for all the dancers and they're always very particular about what they put yeah. into it because they need fuel for their bodies and so it was, was it more of like a vanity sake, like a dancer's body that attracted yes, you at first? absolutely. Yeah. And it was also, I had not really learned about right. what raw living food. When and what you, that means. Yeah. And I thought, oh, they're just a bunch of like, you know, crazies <laughs> and not understanding <laughs> that. Dippies. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, and it was, you know, dancers and hippies and whatever is, does it smell like patchouli? Like I didn't want any part of that. <laughs> 
And then when I realized that it's actually, they're dehydrating living food, so it's energy, it's power, it's mm. the pure form of something, and every part of your membrane, your cells are just absorbing it, yeah. and that's your fuel for the day. Right. So I kind of went on this path because I was up for a very big job that September for Fashion Week, which mm -hmm. in New York is everything. That's huge. Yes, and to be a director of special events for a pretty well-known guy at the time, it was a huge honor. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting myself in great shape and doing Pilates and yoga. And the irony of it all is that that's when I realized I started having body pain. And so time frame, help mm -hmm. me with the time frame. So everything happened in New York in this job. What's the time frame between? So it's basically, it was September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And then my job going into this very large hotel that was a very um, big press worthy mm -hmm. opening. And that was going to be September uh, 2010. So it was a nine year oh, difference. Okay. Yeah. And, and what kind of pains did you start to feel? So while I was doing all of this Ayurvedic and this raw diet and really focusing on my mind, body, and soul, I started having pain in my leg. And I thought I had never pulled a muscle. I thought it was like a Charlie. A nerve thing yeah, I or? didn't I didn't know. Yeah. I because I'd never been in any sort of accident. I had never yeah. broken a bone. I had never pulled a muscle even. Right. So I was getting this pain and then it started waking me up at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, and then I realized, okay, I need to contact someone. Right. And so at that point, um, I went to my primary care who had been my doctor for 20 years. And he had said, you know, your range of motion is bananas. You could put your legs in the back, right. So <laughs> it's not that, so let's see what's happening. Let's get you on an x-ray machine. And, and I was thought, he familiar with all of your, um, like the Ayurvedic and the raw foods and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a very traditional doctor that's not into holistic practices, uh -huh. but he thought, can't hurt. Yeah. You know, at least you're doing something that it's, it's it's good for your body, but he doesn't necessarily believe in a raw vegan diet. Right. But that was okay. Didn't discourage me because I thought I'm doing this for myself and I feel good and right. I look great. So needless to say, I get on the x-ray machine, take an x-ray, leave his office. By the time I got back to my apartment, there were seven voicemails from him. Sandra, call me. Sandra, it's Dr. Tay, call me. Sandra, there's a mass in your femur. I'm like, what's what? a mass? Where's my femur? Like, <laughs> I was really out of body yeah. because I'd been so concentrated on my life and work and wearing my four inch heels and carrying a couch on my head as right. a director of special events right. that that was a huge moment. So I called him on his cell phone and he said, This is real you need to call your family yeah. and i thought okay where's my femur you know and what what is a mass what and does he this said mean? right yeah and so basically he said anything within the bone i'm getting you an appointment as soon as possible at sloan kettering wow. so from that moment on it was on yeah and which which leg the right leg right leg so basically so it was in your bone was it like pressing on the nerve is that what it was basically the size of a tennis ball within my femur so i know it's so shocking and for a good year and a half i couldn't even fathom what was about to happen or that what was going that can't be common right no no so basically yeah. when it when i was diagnosed they do a biopsy mm -hmm. so I had a bone. great, yeah. So they okay. had to break my hip, oh. go in through my hip, down to the femur, and biopsy the tumor. Wow. And from that moment on, it was 50 doctors because it was such a rare diagnosis, and they had never seen a woman in her 30s in, so in America. It was German boys under the age of 10. What? It's called Langerhan cell histiocytosis. Wow. Yes. Say that and three times. I know, <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, it used to be called Histio X, mm -hmm. and I asked the doctors at Sloan, and they said they had one woman ever in the history of Sloan Kettering yeah. with this diagnosis, and she 
showed up once and she never showed up again. So yeah. did she die? Did she get freaked out? They don't know. Did you ever find out? Mm -mm, no. Never no. found out. So, so what did that do to you when you found out that information? By the way, was yeah. it what stage did so they figure out? So they basically, so there's two things that can happen with bone cancer. Okay. Um, they realized that I actually had nodules in my lungs. So they believe it started in my lungs and then transferred to my bone. Potentially from the 9-11. Right. So every year the 9-11 fund would send out papers how is your health? Because anybody that lived, and I lived in the historic right. triangle of Tribeca, and they had said, anybody that lives there, they send out papers every year, let us know how you're doing. So that year, I sure filled up that form, and within, I mean, it was like, as if I put it in the mail, and two days there later, someone, yeah, yeah, someone called me and said, okay, let's get you to one of our doctors, and let's start this whole process again. And I said, you know, at this point, I just need to figure this out. Like, I'll let you know where we are, but I have a great doctor and amazing doctors at Sloan. And because it was such a rare diagnosis, I was put in front of their tumor board. Mm. So I had 50 doctors weighing in. So I was so incredibly blessed. You were very supported. Oh, so yeah. supported. I mean, I had doctors, interns stopping by. Hello, it's so nice <laughs> to meet you. Here I am, like on the demo all drip, like, like what? Oh, yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really. Yes, but so they basically. Bum hanging out. The yeah, back. I know. <laughs> Paper, shirt, whatever. I didn't care. I was like, come on in, help yeah. me out. Yeah, tell yeah. me what's going on. But so after the biopsy, uh, my mom and I went back to um, an apartment, and then. It was a few days later, and my doctor called and said, all right, we're ready to do this. And I said, well, so what's going to happen? Okay. And she said, basically, we're going to break your leg into eight different places, and we're going to cut all of your muscles on the side. Uh -huh. And when we get in there, we're going to see how really if it's whittled away your bones because we may have to amputate we may have to take off part of your leg yeah. we may you might have a limp for the rest what of your you life think when you heard that? at that yeah. moment so oh yeah shocking. it was shocking and yeah. traumatic and what were you 30 36 wow. 36 so, so at that point i felt like all right there's two ways to kind of go with this you either say all right, I'm going in and I don't know what the outcome is or I'm going to take this head on. And, and it's either you you do that, yes. you go that route or it's going to spread through your body and right. you die. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, and that's the thing with... So Was it stage two, three, four? four yeah, three? so they don't really tell you, they didn't tell me a stage, I mm -hmm. think, at that point because it's so much information and it was so quickly right. how they diagnosed it and when she said anything in your bone, like my previous doctor had said anything in your bone, we just need to get it out. And so if it's a life or death moment, I'm like, all right, let's get it out as quickly as possible. Right. And we scheduled the operation a few days later. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a lot to like digest in, oh, yeah. few, in such a short amount of time. Absolutely. And so I'm, you got cut, uh, yeah. chopped up in eight different places yep. on your cut through all the muscle all the muscle Is and the then tumor they basically like eat through your bones yes Is that what's happening? so she said okay. a lot of people with any type of bone cancer mm -hmm. they find it because you end up breaking your leg breaking your bone falling on your arm and then they so find the cancer yes yeah. it just whittles and eats away uh -huh. at any bone wow. existing bone so she said it's a miracle because I was skiing that summer before. I was doing all sorts of water skiing. I mean, yeah. I was like a crazy Active. person. Yeah, Active on my much. mountain bike. I mean, yeah. there was nothing that I didn't do. Yeah. So it was just because I said, and I had kind of always had that, like, let's do this. Let's figure this okay. out. And especially after 9-11 and going through that I, I process. Can see that about you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, we're taking this head on. Let's and do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. when she showed me the drill that she's going to oh. drill into my hip. Why would they do that? <laughs> because I, of course, was like, let me see what we're up oh, against. And okay. then I was like, okay, that's enough. Like, oh, I don't need to wow. see it. Yeah. And the most humbling and probably the most intense moment of my life is not 
even going through the actual operation, but laying in that bed and my mind was intact. My mm. mind said, I'm exactly the same person. I can do this. I can get out of bed. Watch me. And then all of a sudden you try to lift yourself off of that bed and put your leg on the floor and you can't. You cannot You just move. didn't feel like the there synapses was nothing, firing. Or... Nothing. And all the muscles had been cut. And there's no messaging. Nothing. Wow. Nothing. So nothing. It's firing in your brain. And then there's a disconnect. Yeah. And so that to me was much more challenging because here I am in my mid 30s yeah. and I'm now with a walker. Wow. And it took me a half an hour to go one loop around that floor. And this is how soon after you're even moving? They basically surgery? at Sloan, they want you two days after. Right away. Wow. Right away. Okay. And That's you're aggressive. working with, yeah. And, and she said, this is the only way. I was very fortunate. I didn't have to have anything amputated. Yeah. All of my limbs were intact. Wow. Yeah. But it was that to me, being such an independent person, to all of a sudden now having to be completely dependent on others mm -hmm. to help me, that was such a humbling experience. Yeah. So my first day walking around with the walker and now we're getting into the fall. So by the time I left Sloan seven days later, I had a walker in the middle of winter. Neighborhood? Yeah, <laughs> and living in Williamsburg, Brooklyn at the time with okay. all the hipsters and here I am like, <laughs> Hello, walking with my walker and trying to get like some, you know, organic blah, blah, blah to, you know, eat or drink. And the irony, again, of all of this is that right before I had met a woman who had a vegan restaurant called um, Candle Cafe on the Upper West. And now she has one on the Upper uh -huh. East as well. And we just are cross, we paths, our paths crossed, sorry. Yeah. Um, because I was working, doing a hotel deal and it was the first green hotel in New York City. And she wanted to attach one of her restaurants mm -hmm. to it. And yeah. yeah, and she was so gracious and kind and sent me at the hospital bags of raw vegan cuisine. So here she was thinking ahead of my journey and thinking, all right, now she's gonna go back to Brooklyn and I'm gonna live on the top floor of a brownstone and I can't walk downstairs. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna send her home with food that she can now at least nourish her body. An yeah, Joy. Mm -hmm. Her name is Joy. Yeah, and she was truly the first person that really took an interest in understanding that fo food can heal. Yeah. And that's sort of how that whole journey that's where it began. It began there. So now from that point, did you go through chemotherapy? I, yes. So uh -huh. I did not have to do chemo. Well, I opted out of chemo. Okay. So the option was chemo, chemo and radiation, radiation or nothing. Okay. So I decided after talking to about 30 of the 50 doctors and they were actually split on the decision about okay. this. So I said, I've gone through two operations. I'm good with that. I'm going to work with somebody who can do great rehab, mm -hmm. but I'm going to just opt for radiation. So I did six weeks of radiation. And what is that process like? What, what do they do? Are you taking a pill? No, you you're going in. It's very high tech. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I had no idea what to expect. And I will say that there was a woman at Sloan that I, you go into one room mm -hmm. and then you gown change and then you go into another room. And there was a woman there probably mid fifties, tubes everywhere. And she looked at me and I was obviously getting sort of emotional and upset. And she said, I don't know why you're here, but just know you're at the best place possible. Oh. And it was like waterworks. <laughs> okay, let's do this. <laughs> let's do let's this. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. And it, you are put into a it's wild. I mean, it is, these are, it's like laser beams all over. What? And they say, what do you want to listen to? I'm like, Black Sabbath, of course, <laughs> Jack White, whatever Grateful sort Dead. of, yeah, Grateful <laughs> Dead, anything that's going to like take me into a yeah. different moment. Yeah, the laser light. Oh, yeah, up. no, it is. It's truly, it's like, 
it's like going, you have glasses on, they leave the room, everyone goes, and you're there check. alone, and you're on this bed, and then there's lasers coming from all over the place. And so they tattoo little spaces on you where you're gonna actually receive, and it's pinpointed. Wow. So it's exact places. And the idea of that was to sort of, they're going to, if there were any cells that needed to be eradicated around where the tumor was, they'll yeah. do that. And um, the most painful part of it was the actual tattooing, not yeah. even the radiation. Yeah. And the people there were so supportive. I mean, I felt such incredible love. And the more research I did about self-actualization and really creative visualization, that that was the part of it. That was the beginning of it. Because the more people that you can have as your community or your support, Tribe. 100, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Gather those people because in good and bad, that will help you about 90% of the time. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. Really Absolutely. So did you glow in the dark after that? Well, I will tell you. <laughs> did you have to have your own private toilet and everything? Yeah. I mean, it was intense. It was really intense. But yeah. I will say that when I was able to start, so I was on the walker, then crutches, and then a cane. Still mm -hmm. looking like yeah. a 90-year-old, but <laughs> hunched over. But I would set off some of the metal detectors, like on Lower Broadway, which was really fun. And... Um, Did you do it on purpose? Just no, I just, I mean, and it was like, I've always had this thing and all of a sudden now it's like, just keep walking yeah, back and exactly, forth. exactly, <laughs> keep going in. But they do give you a card so you can go into the, um, you don't have to go in, in the airport. But, yeah. um, and then the recovery part was pretty amazing. I mean, I really took it head on and I said, I'm going to go really train with athletes because so I went down to Miami, which was sort of the best place because I thought it's winter. Mm -hmm. Miami is pretty warm and beautiful right. and nice. And I want to go to a center that really works on people that have torn ligaments, torn muscles or, you know, broken legs and bones. And so I just, I trained like an athlete. Wow. I really, really did. Four days a week. I was there five hours a day. and powered through it because what I was told was you have six months to get your your gait back yeah. and your muscles have to sort of understand that they need to get back together and if you don't work it out in those six months that you might have a limb for the rest of your life right. and so I said I'm not gonna I'm not gonna live like that and right. I'm gonna make sure that this doesn't happen to me yeah. so I went full throttle and very, very fortunate and very lucky. And so, in terms of like the food and the nutrition, once you were going through radiation, I, my mom is a cancer survivor, right? And right. she went through chemotherapy. She lost her hair. She um, she would be sick mm. most days. Yes. Um, lost her appetite. How did you did you have any of those symptoms? Oh, sure. Did you deal with yeah. That? I mean, you... more. I was fortunate because I didn't have to go to chemo and. I know that so many people do have those symptoms. Um, what so I, you didn't lose your hair? I mean, I didn't lose it completely. There were definitely, like it would fall out in clumps and yeah. you would think that that was stress and it was also the radiation. And it was also because my body was so depleted. Mm -hmm. So I had been fortunate enough to have an aunt that um, is connected with a Duke University and she hired a nutritional counselor for me yeah. and he wrote up an entire plan and ironically I didn't know that he was a graduate of Hippocrates wow. and so his plan was basically something that I would five years later go to and understand oh this is where it started right. from and this right. is why I was on that program but it was basically so you would completely change no dairy, no wheat, no sugar, no vinegar, no salt, obviously no alcohol, right. no dairy, but it was filling up and also eliminating. Right. And that was something that Hippocrates really taught me about. And it was learning about sprouts and wheatgrass and that um, with wheatgrass, they say that one shot of wheatgrass equals two and a half pounds of organic raw vegetables. 
So I thought that was a pretty powerful statement. So Jeez. I thought, okay, we have to figure out if this is true or not. <laughs> and um, I just went on this total journey. So can you tell me more about foods that are acidic in the body or, or sure. cause acidity mm -hmm. in the body um, versus alkalinizing? Sure. And what they do. Right. How it impacts you. Yeah. Um, so basically most fruit, mm -hmm. so berries, even though you think they're delicious and really good for you, they actually do cause acid. And cucumber, celery, different sprouts, so buckwheat, pea sprouts, that's alkalized. Mm -hmm. um, as well as even lemon in your water, that's alkalizing your water. So Which you would think would be the opposite. It's right, so, yeah. it's uh, it, acidic. acidic. <laughs> right, exactly. But there's a chemical compound that when happens. You add it to the exactly. Water. Yeah. And so the more acid that you put into your body, it causes inflammation. Okay. And when your body's inflamed, it can't digest properly. Mm -hmm. So you're causing, and then what we do, unfortunately, as humans, is that we have breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and we're constantly just... Compounding. Yes. And we don't let our body naturally digest and eliminate. Mm -hmm. So we're just adding more, adding more, adding more, and our bodies can't digest that quickly enough. So when you add some alkalizing products, that helps break down the food mm -hmm. and helps digest. So you can actually take enzyme supplements, but you can also find enzyme-rich foods, which a lot of the alkalizing uh, sprouts, certainly, yeah. they'll do that as well. They help break down any food that's acidic. acidic. So tell me about like some of the um, reasons that you can't have, or not that you can't, but you eliminated dairy, you eliminated um, alcohol, you, like you just gave it's, us a list. Yeah. Do you know why you were? Yeah, because everything that, it's all acid. It all okay. produces acid. It's anything that you're doing to counteract that, you'd be doing to alkalize. Mm -hmm. So basically your pH scale is from zero to 14. Right and seven is neutral. So you actually can get pH strips that you could test on your on saliva. Your tongue, right? mm -hmm. yeah. And they will tell you on a daily basis, you can do this. I do it in the morning and then I do it again at night. Mm -hmm. And you can test your pH, your alkaline or your acidic levels. And that to me is sort of the gauge of what I ate that day. And then you can see, oh right, I actually did have berries or I had too many strawberries and your sugar your insulin that all gets it affected as well so you kind of want to make sure that even if you're going out and you have a meal that you can't necessarily control or you're at a friend's house and that's how the flexitarian comes yeah. into play um, you just want to be able to go and drink something or eat some something raw that will help counter out counteract the Stabilize. exactly yeah. the acid so content you just mentioned flexitarian mm -hmm. you define what that sure means to you. so one of the first days that I was actually at Hippocrates and you go through this series of questioning and they had said you know are you a vegetarian are you vegan are you dairy are you lacto over I mean it was so many different terms but with flexitarian it's sort of like I practice vegetarianism Sometimes I'll have some dairy, you know, if some, something looks delicious and yeah. I can't say no. Yeah. And then also if you're traveling, it's like you're at someone's house in a foreign country mm -hmm. and they make this delicious meal and you look down and you see, oh, it's a chicken. And you're like, sorry, chicken, I'll eat it. And then you eat it because you have to be flexible and you're a guest in someone else's house yeah. and you don't want to ever go through that, you know, awkward, awkward. or, you know, ever... Uh, insult anyone so yeah. yeah you're just a flexitarian so when you were doing this questionnaire at Hippocrates um, it's a lot yeah. that they really oh yeah go through with mm -hmm. you and you learn I imagine you learn so much tell me so a little much. bit about Hippocrates yeah so Hippocrates Health Institute is in West Palm Beach Florida mm -hmm. and they've been there at that location for over 30 years and it started in Boston 20 years before that yeah. and it's run by the Clements and they basically have a raw organic raw food plant-based diet 
and it's actually more than a diet it's a real way of living of lifestyle, of lifestyle. Yeah. and they basically question you about everything that you put into your body and not only in your body but on your body so they've written books about killer clothes and killer fish and I mean because they want people their whole tagline is helping people help themselves right. so they give you all the tools they give you all the information you take what you can you take what you need and you kind of put it into your everyday practice and how did you find out about them what was your well introduction? again this woman joy the angel joy from Campbell Cafe she had been friendly with this woman Chris Carr we love you joy thank you <laughs> <laughs> I know Chris Carr. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly well, um, virtually right sure, yeah. right so and she's actually a health educator too yep. she went to Hippocrates yep. for that training and when she was diagnosed because she lives within the tumors are still within her mm -hmm and she went down to learn about that cuisine for a, a two week or a one week stay and then since then has gone back to become a health educator and That's then great. yeah so she was sort of the inspiration and she had done this uh doc and i saw it years before that and didn't think much of you know i thought oh it's yeah. great educational and then years later understood oh my goodness i should probably look into that place because she went there it's and funny how it all it, comes it's together. so funny how you could be watching a show years before and then when you need it and then it, it pops all makes yeah sense. exactly it makes sense. exactly yeah. so and that's how I found out about it and that's when I researched it and I said okay sign me on for a few weeks and then I after three weeks I went from one program into the health educator program wow. yeah so how long did you stay in the <laughs> we've got a visitor <laughs> how long did you stay in the um, program at like you lived there. Oh yeah, you live on campus. Of. Yep. So I was there initially for three weeks, then I did six weeks, and now I'm going back to complete the nether, the last three. So it'll be nine weeks of being there. And since that, since I've been in that program, my mother's done the three week. Yeah. My aunt, my cousin is going to be there for two weeks Isn't while that I'm so there. Special? It's amazing. And that's also that, yeah. growing your community, your support mm -hmm. system. So when he calls me four days into it and he's freaking out because all he's eating is sprouts and he's doing the infrared sauna and the plunge pool and the Dead Sea Soak and he's feeling like, is this the right thing? And then he breaks through the sixth day and he's like, oh, now I get it. Now I see the world in yeah. technicolor. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I am clean and I am clear. Yeah. And you really have this transformation. And for me, going through that and feeling weak and depleted and my immune system was shot after radiation that just filled me with everything that I could you feel stronger oh, after it you feel invincible alive, alive. Yeah. you feel like you've been given your life back and then you're like I'm not gonna stop now I'm gonna keep going and so what are like the five top foods that you would have been eating there Oh, I mean, sprouts. sprouts. There are 12 different types of sprouts on the buffet oh, wow. every day, every lunch and every dinner. Um, so it's wheatgrass, greased, uh, wheatgrass sprouts. There's any sort of raw vegetable that's in season. So mm -hmm. that's they have a garden on site. Okay. But yeah, so but anything again, alkalizing. So cucumber and your celery and then your um, you know, tomatoes are fruit, not a vegetable, um, but that's on one side of it. Uh, and then we have uh, Ken Blue, who's the chef there, and he would always try to make some, hello, some delicious uh, nut loaf, some, oh, yeah, wow. I know, there's some, those are the sort of like Saturday night special dishes that they have, <laughs> but um, they, yeah, cucumbers, sprouts, wheatgrass, did you ever feel like you weren't filling up, like you were still hungry? No, I mean, because it's it's amazing how many vegetables that you can actually consume. Yes, so they have a raw vegan buffet for lunch and dinner, and there's about 30 different types of vegetables on there. And by the time you get halfway through it, your plate's already full, yeah. but you can go back and go back. But after eating that, for, and there's a whole way of actually eating raw food where they really want you to chew quite a bit. Mm -hmm. 
So before you're even ingesting it, you're actually starting to digest it. Yeah. So you're full, yeah. you're full. And you know, you make your own almond milk there, you make nut milks, so if How you're- How often were you eating throughout a day? Like oh, you're breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Were you just grazing and then big Well, milks, you'd have, you'd make fresh almond milk in the morning and have some of their green powder uh -huh. and you'd make a little shake smoothie. Um, and then you have grouts in the morning, which are grouts, yeah. Not my favorite with water, but um, it's sort of like oatmeal, but not oats. Uh, <laughs> and then you'd have their famous green drink, which is celery, cucumber, buckwheat, sunflower sprouts, and wheatgrass. Mm -hmm. You'd have four ounces of wheatgrass, and you'd have 48 ounces of that green drink. Mm -hmm. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they add um, a delicious E3 Live. E3 Live, E3 Live yeah. which is this um, algae-based mineral mm -hmm. drop. Nice. And so you'd have that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then 48 ounces of the green drink, and then you'd have your wheatgrass shots throughout the day and your Lots lunch. Of oh, yeah. constantly handing you. So you're never, you never feel dehydrated. Yeah. You never feel like you're not uh, satiated and you're eating pretty large meals for lunch and yeah. dinner. That's great. Yeah. So when you left there, how much of that did you implement into your daily life? Sure. Um, well, I absolutely still stayed on the wheatgrass regimen and the sprout and green drink because I felt like even if I'm at school or if I'm at work or if I'm doing something, at least I know that I'm supplementing right. all of those great minerals and, and you don't have the time exactly, to eat exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I think the biggest part of it is just making sure and we're so lucky here in Southern California because everything is sourced from here. Yeah. So they're great companies that grow wheatgrass and sprouts and you can get them at your local market and you can get pallets and you can leave them in your kitchen. And so every morning I'll do at least four ounces of wheatgrass and then I'll make, a, make at least one green drink for myself a day. Do you think that there's any like powders for wheatgrass shots? There like if are. you're not living in LA or yeah. not yeah. You know, in a place I mean, where you can get a powder? The irony again of all of this is that when I was in West Palm Beach, there's a company called Got Sprouts, mm -hmm. and they actually, it's a giant warehouse, and you're welcome to go in and you can see how they grow in their practices, and they FedEx sprouts all over yeah. the country. So while I was traveling, I would have things, my bags delivered mm -hmm. at the hotel, and they come in little FedEx ice packs, and That's great. I know. And you can buy a wheatgrass and sprout, um, a handheld cold press, so oh, wow. you can actually make wheatgrass on the go. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, That's I know. So cool. It's pretty wild. Yeah. But I felt that that was sort of something, at least I knew that I could control that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. Mm -hmm. So now how long it, has it been since you completed your treatment? And how long have you been in remission? Six years? So I would say probably five years in remission because that first year I was still very much actively going through my radiation, which lasted for six, seven months. And then after that, um, you go every six months for scans, the full body scans. And after the first six month scan, they said I was healing well and there was no signs of anything coming back. And my lungs had completely cleared up. So, so those nodules are yep, just gone. Gone. Wow. Gone. So I know. Pretty no amazing. Traces. Nothing. No. Nothing. Congratulations. I know. Thank you. That's it huge. was quite the journey, but I'm on the other side of it. Yeah. Well you're gonna be such an inspiration to mm, others thank who are you. just beginning that process. And I would love to be looking for information and mm -hmm. support. Yeah. That's the goal. Because I feel like you have to when you go through something like this, you have to bring it out and help others. Yeah because there's a reason it you survived it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So cool. Well, thank you for talking with us today thank and you, sharing Heather. your story. Of course. Yeah, so Sandra, <laughs> so much to say, so much to learn from her, and we're really grateful to have her. Thank you, my love, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>